Mount Zion Church, here we are ready to study the Word of God. We're going to begin this week studying the book of Revelation, and we're going to work our way verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all the way through this amazing book of Scripture. We do two things at Mount Zion. We seek to get strong in the Word of God, and we seek to put our faith in Jesus into action. So what we're doing right here, right now, is getting strong in God's Word. So I'm so glad you've joined us. We're going to pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we do thank you. It's so good to go to your Word. It's so good to know your Word is a living and active Word, that you speak to our hearts. Lord God, you reach deep into our hearts. And so, Father, you give us strength, and we ask... Lord, now that you would teach us here, this wouldn't just be the words of a, a preacher, but that you would be speaking to our hearts. Father, we thank you, we love you, we lift up all those on our hearts to you, and we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we are going to begin this book of Revelation now, and this is a book about the future. And what we see here is that God tells us what we need to know about the future so that we can live our lives well today. Sometimes when people read the book of Revelation and other parts of the Bible where uh, God is speaking about the future, it almost becomes kind of like just a thing about knowledge about like what's going to happen and then this is going to happen and then that's going to happen. But you know, God is very practical. In other words, God is seeking to teach us how to live our lives today. And so as he tells us things about the future, it's only what we need to know. He doesn't tell us everything, obviously, about the future. But he tells us what we need to know so that we can make good choices right now, today. You know, we, we live according to what we believe is going to happen. So if you believe that your future is going to be horrible and terrible, that's what you'll live toward. Uh, whatever we believe is going to happen, that's how we, we, we base our life on that. And so here's God telling us what we need to know about the future so that today, in our lives, day by day by day, we are making good, wise choices. So we will see that these are a series of revelations, of visions, that were given to a man named John. John was one of Jesus' inner core of disciples, and God gives him these visions about the future. So let's begin there at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So God the Father gave this revelation. God the Father revealed to Jesus the things that must soon take place, uh, the things of the future that we need to know so that Jesus could in turn give them to us. And so at the second part there of verse 2, he, made, he, Jesus, made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So the word angel means messenger. Jesus sends a heavenly messenger, sends an angel with these revelations, with these visions now of the future, he sends them to this man named John. Now, did you pick up, uh, we read there, the things that must soon take place. Now, we're reading these words here uh, right now, almost 2,000 years after, uh, maybe 1,900 to 2,000 years after they were first written down, and we say the things that must soon take place, because a whole lot of this obviously hasn't happened. But you know what? You know, I'm now 62 years old. And, and even compared to when I was, let's say, 20 years old, I realize how quickly time goes by. Sometimes we say the days are long and the years are short. There's a whole lot of truth to that. When we think about the future, we sometimes think that it, things just stretch on almost endlessly. But in reality, the future comes very quickly. And so here the Father is telling Jesus, now tell my servants, show my servants these things that must soon take place, that were, are going to happen, not forever and ever sometime, but soon. So at verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. He's talking about that man, John. He said, John, he was faithful. 
in bearing witness to the word of God. John learned from Jesus when Jesus walked here on this earth. He learned from Jesus the word of God. And he saw the things that Jesus did. He saw the lives that Jesus changed. He saw Jesus dying on that cross. He saw Jesus risen from the dead. And when Jesus then ascended to the Father, John saw that happen. And John was faithful all the years of his life. He was faithful to bear testimony to all of it, to tell what he saw and what he learned from Jesus. So in other words, the Father said to Jesus, send these revelations to him, to John. Are you and I faithful? Are you and I faithful to bear testimony? Are you and I faithful to, to tell what Jesus has spoken to our hearts, to, to share what we have seen him do in our lives and in the lives of those around us? John was faithful. John was faithful. Are we faithful to bear our testimony, to tell our stories, to tell people what God has done in our lives? Well, if we go on at verse 3, blessed is the one, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So I kind of like reading that, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, because that's what I'm doing right now. There's blessing, right, in sharing the word of God, and then there's blessing in hearing and living according to the word of God. You know, now this is in the New Testament part of the Bible. It was written in Greek. Uh, that word blessed, that was a word that in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, which people like John and those who wrote, even though they were writing in Greek here so that lots of people could understand it, it was kind of like almost the universal language of the time, they were thinking in Hebrew. And that word blessed in Hebrew, it means happy. Happy are those who, who share the word of God. Happy are those who share this particular prophecy with others. Happy are those who hear it, receive it, and live according to it. In other words, God's saying, I am telling you the things that are to come so that you have joy in your hearts. So you have that peace and that joy and that, that confidence in your hearts. I want you to know these things. Because if you know these things, you'll have, you'll have that, that joy. And again, did you see the very last words there in that verse 3? For the time is near. These things are coming. Sometimes we look at our lives and it seems like it's just forever until, you know, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. It just seems like things are just going on and on and on and on. No, the time, the future is near. The day you stand before God the day I stand before God, that day is near. Now, whether it's uh, that day when the Lord returns and gathers all of his people, or, or it's the day that we shut our eyes in, in death, any one of us will be standing before the Lord. That day is near. It's coming quickly. And so the Father tells Jesus, tell my servant John so that he can tell many, so that he will write it down, so that my people will know what the future holds. So now let's look at verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. So now John says, you know what? Here I am. I want to tell you now what happened. The Father told Jesus. Jesus sent an angel to me, and now I'm going to tell you what happened. And so John, the, the first people that he sent this writing to, he says the seven churches that are in Asia. So this would be what... In their time, they would have called Asia Minor, and it would be where the nation of Turkey is today. And these seven churches were stretched on a road, the Romans, Asia Minor was part of the Roman Empire, and they had built a road that went from the coast of the Aegean Sea inland and made a big, like, three-quarter circle. And these churches that we're going to see, he'll, he'll name them here shortly, they were one after the other all around, all around that, that road. So John writes all of this down. That scroll was taken to the first church around that road, that circle of that road. They made a copy of it. Then the original was taken to the second church. They made a copy of it. It's taken to the third church. They made a copy of it. And you know, that it, not just this book of Revelation, but that's how we have this scripture. You know, there's no other ancient documents, no other ancient documents that 
were copied so widely. No other ancient documents that we have nearly the confidence about the accuracy of what we have today as of these scriptures, because the people who were receiving these writings wanted every word. They wanted every word. And so any, this, this book of Revelation, any of Paul's letters, Peter's letters, uh, a congregation would, they would get that, that, that original writing and they'd make a copy of it and then the original would go somewhere else and then maybe someone would hear they have a copy and they'd come and they'd copy thousands and thousands of copies of all these different writings that comprise the New Testament. So John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace. Those two words we keep seeing. We just finished studying First and Second Thessalonians. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul wished or prayed for the churches in, in Thessalonica. He says, grace to you and peace. Grace, the freely given love of God. Peace, that, that shalom, that, that, that peace that all is well. I'm in the Lord's hands. All is well. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. From Jesus from everlasting to everlasting, who is, who was, who is to come, from everlasting, the, the eternal Lord and God, King of kings, Lord of lords. Grace to you and peace from him. And then he says, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, sometimes we picture God uh, kind of alone up there in heaven, and if you know the Bible, you know that the one God of heaven and earth is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we kind of picture God the Father and Jesus at his, his right hand and then the Holy Spirit. But we forget that actually the Bible picture is that God is surrounded. We're surrounded by all the spirit. We're physical beings with a, a spirit, right? Or you might say we have a, a spirit with a, a physical body. Uh, but the angels and all, all the spiritual beings that God created who are around him. And so here, this is fascinating here. So grace to you and peace from him who was and who, who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, Bible scholars have really puzzled over who are, what are these seven spirits? No clear answers except that for John, inspired by God, to write this, some people said those seven spirits, the number seven is a very symbolic number. It represents perfection, completeness, perfection. It's another way of saying the Holy Spirit. From Jesus and from the Holy Spirit, grace to you and peace. Seven meaning perfect. It's the seven spirits, perhaps meaning the, the Holy Spirit. Not for sure, but that's what many Bible scholars have thought. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Wow, from God, God the Father, from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus, the faithful witness. Jesus was faithful every step of the way. He says, the firstborn of the dead, the first one that the Father raised up, Jesus in a perfect sacrifice, uh, the sinless Jesus, a perfect sacrifice for our sin died on that cross. They laid him in that tomb. Jesus had descended with all of our sin even to hell on that cross and dies there. They lay him in that tomb and on the third day, that happened on a Friday, not on the Saturday, but on the Sunday. Sunday morning, the Father raised him up. The firstborn of the dead. Meaning that just as the Father raised his son Jesus up from death, all of those who put their faith, who humble themselves, repent of sin, turn to Jesus, that the Father will raise us up as well. That death is a defeated foe. Jesus defeated the power of death. And so he is the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. He is, Jesus is the ruler of uh, of, of the whole earth, of all those in, in power and authority on this earth, Jesus rules over them all. And with that phrase, we begin to see the direction that these revelations, these visions now, uh, will, will take us. We begin to see now the future. Does it appear to you, as you look around the world right now, 
As you watch the news, read the news, does it appear to you that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth? Doesn't it appear that there is so much wickedness in, in high places? In other words, so much wickedness in, 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 we have horrible dictators, we've got corrupt governments of all kinds. It doesn't appear that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. But one of the things that our God is, is telling us right here about the future, that that day is coming soon when it will be very evident that he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. That there will be no power that will be able to resist him. No power that will be able to defeat Jesus. Jesus will exert his authority over all the earth. So wickedness, evil will come to an end because Jesus will exert his authority over all the earth. If you know that, you can live your life well today. If you, if you know that he will exert his authority over, not just over the kings of the earth, over all people, well, then that means today I repent of sin. That means today I, I, I have confidence and courage when it seems as if wickedness is, is prevailing in this world. It means today I get myself right, right with him and trust in him with all, all my heart. And so we go on there in that verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. Now Paul kind of speaks a word of worship to him, to Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. By his blood shed for us there is grace. There is mercy. There is, there is that forgiveness that when we receive it changes our lives. It frees us from the rebelliousness of our hearts from the, the sinfulness of our hearts that, you know, he has freed us from our sins by his blood, by that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we can be set free, set free from the wickedness of our own, our own hearts. And so this word of, of worship to, to the one who has done this for us, to the one who has done this for us, and at verse 6 then, and made us a kingdom, He's, 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 he's given us uh, uh, himself as our king, as our Lord, as our God. You know, the nations of this world, they go up and down here and there, right? Uh, the, the circumstances of life in this world are just chaotic. And sometimes we go through long seasons where things seem stable and well, and then suddenly, as we've all just experienced now and are experiencing now in this pandemic, it just seems like everything's turned upside down. But here is the one who has given us himself as our king, as our Lord, as our God. He's made us to be, in other words, a kingdom. Priest to his God and Father. Isn't that interesting? That we are those priests in the temple of ancient Jerusalem ministered to God, ministered the love of God to, to the people, but ministered uh, blessing to God. In other words, ministered praise and thanksgiving and worship to God. And so he has called us to be, he has made us to be people who bless God, who, who minister joy. We bring joy to God's heart. When we turn from our sin, we walk in righteousness. When we give thanks in all circumstances, when we pour out our hearts before him, when we humble ourselves before him, we minister to his heart. We bring joy. We are priests to God. We bring blessing to God himself. Isn't that amazing? I mean, how, how often do you think about, I bring blessing to God. But, but when I obey him, when I, when I give thanks to him, when I worship him, I'm bringing, we are all, we're bringing blessing to God. He's made us then to be priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here's this word of praise to our Lord Jesus for all that he's done, all that he's done for us. And now look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. That day is coming when he will return to this earth. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 15 years old, and I'd grown up in church, but somehow I never grabbed hold of any of this. 
And there were some people in that youth group that I became a part of, and they started talking about Jesus coming back to the earth. And I'm like, what? And I remember, I remember thinking, they must be some kind of fanatics or something. And then I actually learned more about the Bible. I'm like, whoa, he is coming. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. The infinite God, God the Son, Jesus, is coming. Every person on the face of this earth will see him the day he comes. He's coming not as he did that first time, a little baby born in obscurity and poverty uh, there in Bethlehem growing up in Nazareth. No, when he comes again to this earth, when he brings, we'll see here, time as we know it to an end. Time was created by God. It had a beginning. It will have an end. When he comes and he eventually then brings time as we know it to an end, everybody will see that day when he comes. He's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Look at this. Even those who pierced him. Even those who pierced him. Those who hung him up on the cross. Yes. Those who jammed that crown of thorns on his head. Yes. But have we not all pierced him? Have we not all pierced him with our sinfulness? Have not and do not those who say, I don't need any Jesus. I don't need his blood shed for me. Uh, I, I don't need to do what he's telling me to do. Isn't that piercing Jesus? Even those who have pierced him will suddenly see him that day. Will suddenly see him that day. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Because it will be clear that God has shown up. That Jesus has shown up. We are all responsible, accountable beings. It will be clear that day, a day of judgment is coming. People can laugh at preachers right now when they talk about a day of judgment. But on that day, when Jesus shows up, all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him because they'll remember what all those preachers, crazy preachers said, a day of judgment is coming. And they'll wail on account of him. And then look what John says, even so, amen. Even so, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, he says. Even though uh, th they will wail on account of him, he says it's a good thing because if the history of this world is to continue the way it is now forever, if the wickedness of this world is just to go on and on and on, if this is not what we know now, just chapter 1 and then there's a chapter 2 where Jesus is in charge, if this is just the way it's always going to be, then that's terrible. That's horrible. And so John says, though many will wail that day, Many will, will cower in terror that day. Even so, he says, it will be a good thing. He says, amen. In other words, let it be. Let it be so. Because Jesus is coming. He's coming to bring an end to all the suffering and all the pain and all the wickedness of life in this world as we have known it thus far. And so at verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. That's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. I'm the beginning and the end. I created this world. I created time itself. I'm bringing time and the world as you have known it thus far to an end. I'm the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He says, that's who I am. Now, at verse 9, here we have a first vision now, that, a first revelation, a first vision that that angel brings to John. So he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. He said, I was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now here we're given a clue. John is in jail on an island out in the Aegean Sea because he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. He wouldn't stop proclaiming Jesus. And the people of the Roman Empire, they didn't want anything to do with it. They thought these Jesus followers were weird. They thought they were, they thought they were wicked. You know, if the, if the king, a king came or the emperor came, these Jesus followers wouldn't bow down and worship. Everybody else did because they wanted money. They wanted tax money from that king or that emperor. 
but these Christians wouldn't do it. And, uh, and for a hundred other reasons, everyone thought these Christians were weird and they just didn't like it. So John's in jail. And that's why he says, look, I'm your brother and partner in the tribulation. That means huge trouble. And in the kingdom. Yep, a kingdom that now we live in, in the midst of all the trouble of this world and the patient endurance that we have to have in a world that thinks we're weird, in a world that doesn't get us, in a world that, that, that just doesn't like what we're all about. So John is, is in jail because of all that. And at verse 10 then he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He said, I was filled with the Spirit of God. It was the Lord's day, the first day of the week. Why, why do we worship on the first day of the week? Because Jesus rose from death on the first day of the week. I was filled with the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now, when I say he was in jail, was he in a jail cell? Or maybe was he outside at this point? This was uh, an island that he couldn't escape from. He couldn't get, get away. So we don't know if he was in a jail cell, if he was outside. But he says, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. He said that the voice I heard, it just was almost like a trumpet sounding. Saying, write what you see in a book and send it, write it down. Now, when it says what you see in a book, what they called a book, we would call a scroll. They didn't have books like this yet. Write it all down on a scroll or in a book and send it to the seven churches. And here they are now, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardi, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. In other words, the Lord, the angel the Lord sent, tells him, write these things down, and then you make sure that letter gets to those seven churches. And even though John was imprisoned by the Romans, that was not unusual, just like people in jail today can write letters to family, to friends. And so... At verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Seven golden lampstands. We'll see in a moment, those golden lampstands, lampstands represent the seven churches. We are, what did Jesus say? He said, you are the light of the world. Every congregation, every group of Jesus' followers were like a lampstand. We're a light shining. And each one of us individually. He says, you are the light of the world. You're, you're a light shining in this world. We want the light of Jesus that shines through us to shine brightly here in Hartford County and in all this world. You know, the, the light of Mount Zion Church shines in Namibia and Southern Africa where, where we operate an orphanage. We founded it. We operated all these 18 years now. The light of Jesus shining through Mount Zion is shining brightly in Cambodia, where because you all give generously, Matt Bowman, who grew up there and had worked with orphans there for many years, is now feeding the hungry there and, and making sure that impoverished villages have fresh water. The pandemic has hit over there as well, and there's no tourism, and people all lost their jobs. The light of Jesus shining through Mount Zion Church is shining there. Shining in a, a county down in southern West Virginia where there's a whole lot of poverty. And because you all are so loving and prayerful and generous, the light of Jesus is shining there, not just here in Hartford County, but all around this world. We are a lampstand. So John turns around to see the voice. He sees seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. That's Jesus. Jesus referred to himself again and again as the Son of Man. He said, I turned and there was Jesus standing in the midst of the churches. Jesus is always with us. Didn't Jesus say that time whenever two or three gather in my name, there I am in their midst. Whenever you pray with one other believer, whenever we gather together for worship, there is Jesus in our midst. He's always with us. Whether someone's with us or not, he's always with us, but in an in a, in a even more powerful way when there's even just one other believer. That's why we can't afford to get isolated during this pandemic time. You know, if you need to be apart because of vulnerable health, well then get yourself a prayer partner that you can pray with over the phone, maybe every day for 15 minutes or once a week for an hour, hour and a half, whatever it is. I'll help you get a prayer partner because we can't be isolated. 
can't, we can't just, you know, wall ourselves in and be isolated. Uh, he's with us when two or three gather in his name. So he says, uh, clothed with a long robe and with a, a golden sash around his chest, he's, he's one of power like, like a king, the king of kings. He says, the hairs of his head were white. I got all this white hair going on up here now. What does white hair symbolize? It symbolizes wisdom. Here's the one of all wisdom. He sees, John sees now this vision. And there's Jesus with, with a, a head of, of white hair and the one who is all wise, all knowing, all wise. Like his head, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. In other words, penetrating. He sees all. There's nothing that is hidden from him. There's nothing going on in this world that's hidden from him. Nothing going on in our lives that's hidden from him. Nothing going on in our heads, in our hearts that's hidden from him. His eyes are penetrating. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, meaning strong, all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. You can't stop the sound of the ocean, the, the, the waves crashing uh, at, at the shore. Uh, you can't stop the sound of a waterfall. You cannot stop the voice of Jesus. You can try to run away from Jesus. You won't be able to close your ears enough to not hear his voice. Um, cruel, gov wicked governments can try to destroy the church. Can't do it. His voice roars like many, many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. We'll see in a moment these seven stars represent seven angels. Each of those seven lampstands, each of those seven churches had an angel, a messenger from God assigned to that church. Wow. I don't know for sure, but I wonder, has the Lord assigned an angel to this church? I have a feeling. Because he certainly told us here all seven of those churches had an angel assigned to each one of them. And so in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His word is penetrating. His word goes deep into our hearts. You, 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 you can't. You can try to close your ears. You can't. His word goes deep into hearts. Like a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Isn't that beautiful? One day we will see the face of Jesus. It will be like the sun shining. One day we will look into his eyes, those eyes of penetrating perfect love. Wow. So at verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he lay, he said, I was just overwhelmed. I just... I, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me. <laughs> Jesus reached out, laid his hand on John. Here's John in prison. He knows his brothers and sisters back on the mainland there in Asia Minor. He knew there was horrible persecution going on there. He knew that. He, he, he knew they were going through hard, hard times. He, he carried that with him. He loved them. He led, them. He led many of them to Jesus. Uh, the scholars are almost certain that John was kind of the overseer, the bishop or the overseer of the churches in that region. He led many of them to Christ. He loved them and now he's, he's away from them. He can't do anything to help them and he knows that they're suffering. And here now he has this vision of Jesus and he falls down. He falls down on the ground. But Jesus laid his right hand on him. Can you just feel the right hand of Jesus coming down on your shoulder? Wow. He laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. Fear not. He said, I know you're thinking about what's happening to all your brothers and sisters. I, I, I know you're, you're wondering what's going to happen to you. I know now, seeing me here, you, 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 you just, you, you just, you're, you're so aware of your, your, your own sinfulness. He puts his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. I hold all power, John. John, don't think these Roman emperors and Roman kings who bring so much wickedness, 
against your, your friends, your brothers and sisters, against my people, don't think they've got the end of the story. Don't think they're going to win the day. I am the first and the last. And the living one he says, I'm alive. <laughs> I am alive. I'm a living God. We don't have just a memory of somebody who lived a long time ago. If that's all we had, we have memories about George Washington, our first president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, whatever. We have memories. If all we had was memories about Jesus, then I'd say, turn this Bible study off. Don't come to church anymore. Memories, okay, they're great, whatever. Here's Jesus saying, no, no, I am the living one. He puts his hand on John's shoulder and says, don't be afraid, John. Fear not. I, I have all power. I am the living God of heaven and earth. He says, the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. John, you saw me that day. You came running to the tomb early in that Sunday morning. You saw that the tomb was empty. And then, John, when you went back and Peter went back to tell the other disciples, didn't I show up that night, John, risen from death? And then I spent all those days with you after that. And then, John, you saw me ascend to the right hand of the Father. I didn't go back to death, John. I am alive, the living God of heaven and earth. And now, John, I'm showing you the things that are to come. I'm showing you what the future holds, John, telling you what you need to know about the future so that right here, John, you right now here in this prison and all the people who will read these words will know how to live their lives well because I'm telling you the things that are to come. He says, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. See, that's what we need to know. Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades, hell. He, 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 we will stand before the Father. We will stand before Jesus. There will be a day of judgment. People, I know people laugh at preachers talking about a day of judgment. But that's what he's saying. That day is coming. That day's coming, John. That day is coming. John was someone who was done terrible, terrible, terrible wrongs. And he knew his brothers and sisters back in the mainland were, were enduring horrible, even worse wrongs than, than John had endured. He knew that. And here's Jesus saying, just remember, John, I come to judge the earth. I come to judge the earth. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Maybe he's saying to John, you know, these Roman soldiers who guard you here in this, this jail, here in this island of Patmos, uh, you wonder sometimes, maybe they might just show up in your cell one day and take you off to, to execute you. Just remember, John, I hold your life. I hold the keys of death and Hades, hell. Just remember that, John. You're in my, you're in my hands. Wow, if you know that, if you know that, Yep, then we get ourselves right with Jesus and then we live with courage and confidence and strength that I'm in Jesus' hands. It doesn't matter what some pandemic does. It doesn't matter what this person does or that government does or whatever. I'm in Jesus' hands. That sets you free from all the, the fears of this world. It sets you free from all the anger of this world. People get all freaked out and angry about what's going on in the world. If you know you're in Jesus' hands, you don't get freaked out. You don't get all frustrated and angry about what's going on in the world if you know that you're in Jesus' hands. Wow. And so at verse 19, write, therefore, the things that you have seen. Write these things down, John. I want you to write them down because, John, this vision isn't just for you. This vision and all these visions that I'm going to show you, John, these are for my people, all my people through the ages until that day when I do come. This is for all of them, right? So write the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. I'm going to tell you some things about what's going on right now, and then I'm going to tell you some things about the future. And then Jesus explains to John, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, angels, messengers from God, God speaks to us, doesn't he? Sometimes he speaks directly to our hearts. Sometimes he speaks through his word. And whenever we read his word, he's speaking to us. Sometimes he speaks to us in a, in a song of worship. Sometimes he speaks to us through a sister or a brother that he, he sends to us uh, with a word of counsel. Sometimes he speaks to us through an angel. And we don't even know it. Wow. 
So he says, I, I send the angels. I send my messengers with messages. So he says, as for this mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angel of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Brothers and sisters, let's choose. Let's choose to be a light shining in this world. Let's choose to know the things that are to come. Let's get the blessing. He said, blessed are those who hear and live according to this word. Let's get the blessing. Let's get the joy and the peace and the courage, which leads to then the strength to truly love as we have been loved. Let's get the blessing of hearing and living according to his word. Wow. Hey, I hope you might consider, you might consider spreading the word about this Bible study. It's going to be on our website all, all the time. You can do it together live every, every Monday night together, but then it's on the website, mzpraise.org. You just click Bible study, and you can do these Bible studies anytime. I'll be putting the new one up every, every Monday, and we're going to work our way all the way through this book of Revelation so that we get that blessing of knowing what God knows we need to know about the future so that we can live our lives well today. Well, I have really enjoyed going into the word here right now. Uh, we're going to pray. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Lord God, that your word is truth. We thank you, Father, that you tell us, you remind us and you tell us the things that are to come so that we can choose well today. And Lord God, we ask that uh, you would give us the ears to hear, give us the hearts to receive your word. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we could understand your word, that we could grab hold of it, that we could live according to it. Father God, we thank you. We love you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you, Mount Zion. I'm really looking forward to this. Hey, I've got some announcements coming up about next steps for Mount Zion Church. Look for those, and uh, I'm really excited what's going on here. I'm really excited to see what God is going to be doing in the future in these days that are ahead. God bless you. See you soon.